So um, the landscape of Britain, um, although we don't always realise it, is um, scarred with the haunting remains of uh, lost cities, ghost towns and vanished villages. These were places that were once brimming with life and full of hopes and dreams and, and, and bells and vision. But now, sadly, for the most part, they're just um, spectral echoes, which are um, in the cold grip of the earth. And um, over the last uh, four years or so, um, I've been on what sounds like rather a morbid journey, but actually it was rather uplifting and cathartic by the end. Um, an itinerary of destruction um, through these places, um, not just to resurrect the past, but also to hopefully bring into focus the fragility of the present. Um, and also in some cases, um, I'm afraid to present um, an awful premonition of our likely future. So the journey began in the first instance um, on a windy beach in Orkney, where I encountered this, which I think some of you will hopefully agree. Um, it looks rather incongruous. When I first saw it, it resembled, um, I thought, a crazy golf course. And uh, that, that shouldn't blind us to the significance of this site. This was, when it was built, um, one of the most extraordinary things that had ever been built up until that point. It's not really that much of an exaggeration to say it's the, the point from which our entire civilized history um, unfolds in these um, islands. And how funny then to think that this was lain concealed um, for over 5,000 years in that antithesis of form, sand, um, until in the year 1850, a cataclysmic sea storm, um, the first of many in the book, um, ended up like ripping off the grassy knoll from the dune and revealing inside a series of identically sized huts, about eight in number, connected by a slithering passageway and sunk in, in wraps of its own primeval muck. Um, so what you're looking at um, is actually older than Stonehenge. Um, it's older even than the pyramids. And when this was built, it, it was just fantastically avant-garde uh, because it was built in that great transition period um, between humankind being marauding hunter-gatherers and actually putting down roots, um, establishing fixed communities um, sustained by agriculture. And it must have seemed like a doomed experiment. The book is, as, as Rosie said, full of false starts and dead ends. And um, quite a lot of people must have thought, well, this was never going to take off. Um, because at the time, as I'm sure a lot of you know, built structures tended to be for the dead, not the living. They wanted to kind of dignify their meager lifespans with this kind of cosmic significance. And for two and a half million years, we'd been marauding around. And now we were gonna work the land and husband animals um, for our own sustenance. And to everyone's surprise, uh, it, it worked, it survived. So it was built around 3200 BC and uh, flourished uh, for the next 750 years. So when you see the sites, which you can go and visit, you can go and walk, you can go and peer in, um, much of it does seem fairly alien. There's a really sort of eerie, um, uncanny sense that the residents have just left. This is prehistory as well. So there's no written sources. We don't really know, it's just guesswork, what their worldviews were, the kind of structure of society, how they saw their place in the world. So most of the time, um, all you can really hear is the wind in your ears. Um, but at the same time, there is this really sort of strange kind of familiarity. Just look into that. Um, it contains much of what I, what I bet you're all looking at, if you're not looking at me, in your living rooms um, this evening. Um, it's got fireplaces, it's got cupboards, it's got mantelpieces, it's got tables, um, it's got chairs, it's even got fridges that contain the swirling limpets. So this kind of sense of mellow domesticity um, brings a kind of flicker of warmth and familiarity that does challenge our relationship with deep time and, and, and sort of cuts through um, the cold abyss of millennia. A um, hundred people lived here um, up until the year 2500, or around about that point, um, at which point the entire community mysteriously vanishes. So no one really knows whether it was because of the sandstorm, whether it was because some kind of plague, whether the young drains away, um, or because bronze had replaced stone and that changed the sort of calibration of society. We just don't know. But this did prove that settled communities could be 
uh, a success story um, in these aisles paved the way for all the towns, cities and burgs and villages that followed in its wake. Um, the biggest efflorescence of which was in the early Middle Ages. And you can see here, Scarabray, look how close the sea is getting towards it. So um, perhaps having vanished once, it may soon vanish again. One of these uh, medieval cities, uh, I just want to sort of show you a picture of it now, and hopefully you'll be able to admire all the streets, the lanes, the alleys, the cathedral, the hawk houses, um, the graveyards and the rest of it, all the other accoutrements of a medieval city um, in all its glory. So here it is. Um, I, I'm sure of the collective intake of breath that I can't hear because you're all muted. Um, it's all underneath the rippling waves of the narrow seas. Old Winchelsea in Sussex uh, was established in Saxon times and arose to great prominence um, by the 13th century. Um, it was a sort of tagliatelle, if you like, of twisting, winding streets parceled in seawater. And the whole thing was built on a great shingle spit. Now that might sound like the most insane thing in the world to have um, built a city on. Um, but for anyone who's ever been to the great shingle promontory of Dungeness, um, which Old Winchelsea lay off, actually it was pretty firm ground. Um, it gave unrivaled access to that highway of commerce, the sea. Um, and it rapidly grew to become um, an entrepot of, of wood and herring and salt and delicious frothy light pink wine from Gascony. So, so far so good. Um, until round about the middle of the 13th century, um, the medieval warm period gave way to the little ice age. And as we know to our own cost, when you have these big climactic shifts, they're often accompanied by unusually tempestuous weather. Um, and storms battered the city of Old Winchelsea from 1250. The monk Matthew Paris with apocalyptic glee, no relation to the journalist, I don't think, talked about kind of entire rows being clawed off um, and falling into the sea. Um, and then in 1288, he describes how you know, the sun vanished from view, the sky turned black, and the entire city was lost in the undulating mountains of the sea. A few months before the King Edward I had rocked up on, I guess, what we would describe as a fact-finding mission. He was a macho king. He wasn't going to let anything of puny as nature lay low his favourite sunk port. But he did observe how much of Old Winchelsea is drowned and the rest hopeless long to stand, which I think are haunting words both um, in his day and our own. So he decided, um, like a precious relic in a cathedral, he was going to rebuild it. He was going to translate the city on a hill several miles inland, um, where safe from the ravages of the sea, it would rise up again as the greatest sank port. And it's sort of like two fingers up to nature, rather unusually for a medieval city, he forged it to this grid iron layout with these intersecting arrow straight thoroughfares, um, showing that he was going to tame these wild forces that had so um, drowned the predecessor city. So you can see there's an absolutely vast um, tidal estuary um, to the north, which it shared with Rye and ships would dock um, from all over Europe. And um, one of the um, most sort of ubiquitous things you'd find in New Winchelsea were these little sort of stone cellars leading underground, which are quite drab and moribund places today. But back then they were sort of alive with lute music and flickering gargoyles and um, merchants piercing these barrels and out of which would gush what they described as the um, creator of the world's happiness or an elixir that removes sorrow and takes it away from the soul, which is of course wine. Um, it was wine that gave it its swagger and prosperity and status. It was a very cosmopolitan place with about between 5,000 and 10,000 people. Um, by 1350, it seemed nothing could stop the inexorable rise of New Winchelsea, which makes it all the odder that when you visit today, there's no station. Um, the breed, I was worried about how I was going to get across it, but it's, it's sort of dwindled to this pathetic, dismal little stream, which you can basically skip across. Then you see a gate on the horizon, you go through expecting to find the kind of medieval core, and it's just dead. Um, to say it's sleepy is an understatement. It's comatose. There's one shop, there's one pub with a, with a dismal wine list, very unlike these 90 wine caves. And then when you walk further south, where this Monday market was, the entire thing just gives way 
to these kind of lonely green fields. Um, it just stops and you walk over these strange dips and bumps and you realize all the streets are now underground. And you walk for what feels like miles and you find a sight that sort of makes the soul quiver, which is uh, the new gate, which was once one of the main entrances to the city. Now it's just marooned in rustic isolation. So how on earth did you go from one to the other? Um, well, having laid low the predecessor city, nature had played a particularly cruel trick on New Winchelsea in that the sea retreated. A new accumulation of shingle um, meant that the harbour silted up. The entire thing became exsanguinated. It was helped on its way by the Black Death and by about seven burnings at the hands of the French and the Castilians. Um, by the 1560s, there was just one sailor left and no boats, so we don't know how he sailed. And then in 1722, Daniel Defoe reached a similar conclusion. To me, really, he said nothing of the city, but the destruction of it seems to remain. So what do we see in these ruins? Um, because you'd think that it would be quite depressing, but actually they're strangely cathartic and uplifting. Um, I felt, as I was writing this book, going through a period of bereavement, um, divorce, and, and God knows whatever else, and actually, the more you meditate upon these ruins, the sort of less of a ruin you become yourself. And, and they sort of emblematize how an, an absence can actually have much more presence than something that is still there. And as Henry James said about Dunwich, another lost city, he says, you know, the minor key is struck with such felicity, it leaves no sigh unbreathed. So by the end of it, it's actually rather a um, sort of, you know, discordantly cathartic experience. That's Winchelsea today, that's what it once was. Talking of why people were drawn to vanishing and abandoned and places that are marooned in the margins of time, St Kilda, I'm sure lots of you or some of you have, have dared uh, to make the journey there, and many were the sort of philosophical voyages of the 18th century that sort of saw these sort of great fangs of rocks as though they clash, crash landed from heaven, and in the 18th century, um, they thought this would be some sort of empirical test to find out what natural man was like beneath the accretions of civilization, which were um, ever more conspicuous in the 18th century. So was natural man um, a Hobbesian brute or some kind of prelapsarian innocent? That was the question. And they were delighted to find these people living a very primitive style of life, as they said, obviously it's mediated through their travelers' reports, grabbing fulmars and puffins from the stacks um, they had no concept, apparently, of property, of money, um, luxuries like tobacco and coffee were unknown to them, and to everyone's delight, uh, there was no crime, there was no adultery, uh, they didn't even have locks on the door, so it seemed to confirm this Lockean, um, sort of Shaftesbury idea of, kind of natural morality that flowed between a sort of shared empathy between human beings. Unfortunately, they were also aware that their very presence was corrupting this way of life, introducing tokens of the civilized world, like tobacco, like alcohol, making the whole community less dependent upon this sort of bird grabbing, um, which was fine when the ships turned up, but less fine when they didn't. And by the Victorian period, entire steamers full of tourists um, arrived and um, they, 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 they sort of commodified the whole way of life. So the Kildons begin to collude with these prejudicial um, expectations, pretending they didn't know what a mirror was, pretending they didn't know what a gun was, um, filling the islanders with a sense of wanderlust, making it clear that there was an easier life to be had elsewhere, um, until in 1930, um, the final uh, islanders, 36 in number, have their final meal of bird soup. They round up their dogs, throw them in the bay, drown them, and then they sail off to a new life on the horizon. And that was the end of the community of St Kilda. You can see here them like vultures staring at them. Very briefly, because we're very much running out of time. Uh, St Kilda was abandoned deliberately, um, or willingly rather. The same could not be said for Capel Kalen in Trewaran, um, an idyllic, one of the sole remaining Welsh speaking villages left in North Wales drowned beneath 68 billion gallons of water to slake the industrial thirst of Liverpool with these uh, councillors here who look rather like Hitchcock villains. And there was the mother of all resistance campaigns to no avail. 
and it was seen as a constitutional outrage, a, a, a latest manifestation of um, England's oppression of Wales, but all the villagers could do was to stand on the banks and watch as their former houses went under. And that for me is a, was probably the most haunting place I visited, a metaphor as well for the ravages of um, human behavior, man-made climate change. So I wish that what I've been talking about tonight was safely confined to the pages of history. Not the case, as anyone who lives in Skipsey will tell you, or Fairborn in Wales, and not just coastal villages, um, but riverine and coastal cities as well. Not least London. Um, reports, many reports have showed that by 2090, a vast swaths of London will be underwater. So as it's said of Dunwich, if you can stand on those crumbling cliffs in Suffolk, you're meant to be able to hear the 50 bells clanging from the deep. Who knows, perhaps in not, not, not that long a period, unless we have truly radical action to intervene globally, we'll be standing on Hampstead Heath, listening down for the ghostly bells of the submerged Wren churches in the watery wasteland below. So on, on that um, uplifting note, uh, I'll hand back to Rosie. Thank you very much for listening.